Welcome everyone to our second program of Mashpee Clean Water's Virtual Conversations. Tonight we're going to be talking about how to use shellfish to clean our waters. Just a few program notes real fast. We are videotaping this, so um, please know that if you speak or ask a question, you will be uh, put on YouTube. We've actually been getting really good uh, views on our YouTube uh, account. We have a little YouTube channel going, so please feel free to follow that. that. Uh, if you want to come off mute and you're on the telephone, use star six. Otherwise, you put your cursor in the bottom of the screen and you can um, turn your microphone on and off and we welcome you to turn on your video as well. And I just want to remind everybody the whole point of this is that it's, is, it's about learning. Every question is a good question, and I hope everybody feels comfortable uh, raising their hand after we get going. Uh, real quick, this is our committee. We have a great committee, but we're welcome more. There's a lot to do between now and next year. And uh, uh, we're actually going to have a, another committee meeting after this uh, meeting. So please stay on the line if you want to join in and, and uh, find a way that you can contribute to this effort. Our guests tonight are Roland Samimi from UMass Dartmouth and Rick York from the Mashpee uh, Department of Natural Resources. Uh, we also have Ashley Fisher, shellfish constable, and uh, we might have Chucky Green from the Wampanoag tribe um, joining us as well to talk about um, the, their shellfish project. So without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to Roland and he's going to give us a, a introduction to uh, oyster filtration as an in situ nutrient and water quality management approach. So Roland, take it away. All right. Thank you, Mary. Much appreciated. And um, thanks for inviting me to, to participate in this. Um, I just really, before, before we get going, I really wanted to just um, thank not only you for all the efforts that you and, and citizens are putting into trying to improve things in, um, in Mashpee estuaries, but also to Rick, who's been putting just his heart and soul into this whole um, shellfish propagation thing and, you know, in, 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 in fighting the good fight to improve water quality in, in Mashpee estuaries. And also I wanted to even though it's even though it's kind of odd to thank the town, but I did want to just say that Mashpee, you know, is one of the first towns to really fully embrace this this whole approach of of utilizing shellfish as a mechanism for improving water quality in estuaries and 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 dealing with nitrogen management, and that's something to be grateful for as well. And and um, and I thank the town for everything that they're doing. And you know, there's always room for improvement. And there's always more to do, but at least at least things are things are going. And um, you know that said, we've been sort of involved in this effort for a long time. You know, um, looking to quantify the effects of of nutrients on estuaries, nitrogen in particular, and um, and and how we can come up with as accurate targets as possible to drive restoration in these impaired um, waters. And also to come up with innovative ways of, um, of implementing solutions to, to get to where we all want to be in as, as cost effective a manner as possible. And so, you know, there are a lot of tools in the toolbox, for lack of um, a better term. And, um, and shellfish is one of them. Uh, one of the big questions really is, quantifying the degree to which shellfish can be an effective in situ mechanism for driving water quality um, improvements and, and managing nutrients. And that's, that's, a tricky, that's a tricky calculation. It's a tricky question to answer. Um, as towns have been, you know, seeking innovative approaches, we've, um, you know, been driving our research interests in the direction of, of trying to answer that question. And so we, we, you know, we've gotten a number of different studies going a little bit all over the Cape, you know, multi-estuary study in Falmouth to sort of figure out how shellfish grow under different conditions in different estuaries. How well do they survive? How well do they grow? 
um, under changing conditions. You know, we've done studies in Little Pond, again, to try and quantify how shellfish affect water quality and cycling. We've done it in Bourne's Pond. We've looked at it in the Quashnet River, in the Mashpee River, in Lonnie's Pond, in Cockey's Pond. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a heavy lift, but in each area that we, that we seek to understand the role of shellfish, we come up with, with a little bit more information that gets us to understanding just how effective are they where. Um, if you could just go to the next slide. Um, part of the reason that we're so interested in it um, and how to do it is obviously uh, a very simple, straightforward reason is they move a lot of water. And I came across this little factoid that was pretty cool. You know, historical oyster population in Chesapeake Bay could filter the entire volume of the bay in less than a week. That's pretty staggering to me. I mean, that's assuming all the shellfish were, you know, as healthy as they ever were, you know. But that's 18 trillion gallons of water in less than a week which is pretty astounding. And so, you know, as, as Rick has, has, has always known this filtration capacity and as other people have known and as we have known, we're like, hey, well, just so how, how well do they do it? And, you know, and how, how well can we quantify this effect in order to then bring it into management world? Because at the end of the day, in management world, you got to be able to sort of ask, answer the question, well, how much will they have an effect? And that's kind of what we've been trying to drill into, whether it's putting them out on the bottom in trays or floating them in bags, you know, and whatnot. Um, let's go to the next slide. This, this is pretty much trying to get to the heart of the question of how do they do it and quantifying the ways in which they do it. And it looks a little bit complicated, but it's not really as complicated as it looks. I mean, essentially you've got the oysters in their, in their floating bags and they filter water and they draw in phytoplankton, which is what they, they feed off of and grow. And as all things that eat, they also poop. And so, you know, you get these pseudo feces that drop out of them and that, you know, that's an organic nitrogen that makes its way into the sediments and then what happens in the sediments well there's a whole set of biogeochemical processes that take place that transform this nitrogen you know the oysters take in nitrogen from the phytoplankton they use some of it they excrete some of it and then what happens and then those excretions get into the sediments and then the sediments do their thing and transform the nitrogen and uh, re-release it to the water column in a different form, in an organic form, and that can be reused or it can be denitrified and then expelled as N2. Our goal as scientists, as researchers, is quantifying all these different effects so that ultimately if you want to use it as a management tool and then you have to answer the questions of, well, you know, how much credit should we get for putting out oysters to X amount in this estuary and, 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 and improve water quality, what, 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 sort of, what sort of credit do we get for that in management world or in regulatory world? That's a difficult question to answer and that's kind of what we're trying to chip away at, you know, under the estuaries project, everything, you know, everything scientific ultimately has to get put into management land and regulation land. And, um, and so then we put on our researchers hat to try and then answer those questions. So, you know, our interest in oysters is mainly because of the high filtration rates. They grow very fast. They have commercial value and they can thrive mm, in nutrient rich, warm waters, you know, in a broad range of salinities, much like the conditions that we have in a lot of the estuaries, you know, in southeastern Massachusetts. And they're not the only ones that do it. Clams do it also. You know, the little blurb down there is 10 to 12 gallons a day of water can pass through a two inch clam. 30 to 50 gallons a day can pass through a two inch oyster. Big difference. So 1 million oysters, you know, about 11 billion gallons of water per year. You know, and that ultimately has an effect on particulate organic nitrogen, which they draw out of the water column, can reduce it to as much as 50%. And then there's a little 
bit of the bottom of the screen that's cut off that is the next little factoid, which is that it re they can reduce water column chlorophyll by as much as 28%. So that filtration capacity is sort of where we're coming at in terms of improving water quality. You know, taking out a bit of the chlorophyll improves water clarity, filtering out particulate organic nitrogen and, and, and in, in the form of phytoplankton also improves water quality and that then affects the nutrient cycling. And, and then ultimately, you know, you might harvest the oysters out of the estuary. So now you've basically removed the nitrogen that they've taken up from the water column or they'll return it to the sediments and part of it will be recycled and a part of it can be denitrified and then expelled as nitrogen gas. And, um, and, and so, so that's kind of where we've been coming from trying to put numbers on all of those little, all of those little processes. Now, you know, just to keep them droning on, if we go to the next slide, we'll just hit a couple take home points, which is that oyster aquaculture and propagation can most certainly be an effective mechanism to varying degrees on improving water quality in situ, you know, because of their filtration capacity. You know, it's always been known that they, they filter and, you know, they filter water and the water is clear and happy and this is a good thing. And it's also an effective tool, again, to varying degrees for managing nutrients and improving water quality. Again, every estuary is different. They all have different targets. They all have different assimilative capacities. They have all different kinds of circulation, all different kinds of loadings. And so, you know, as a tool, it's not a one tool to do every job. It's a specific tool to be used in a specific set of circumstances and in, in that manner to be effective as just one of many approaches that you use to improve water quality. The effectiveness, as I've already mentioned a couple of times, varies depending on the characteristics of the estuary that you are trying to do things in. I mean, in, in Lonnie's Pond, the oysters that we've been, you know, working with seem to be doing quite a bit better than, than say, in the, in, in the Cockies Pond, salt pond in the town of Westport, where we've also been doing this sort of research for about three years now, coming up on four years through a large EPA grant. And, um, and again, so look, you know, is, is, is Cockies Pond the best place to do oyster propagation to try and improve water quality? Maybe not. You know, what are the conditions in Cockies Pond? Well, they have very low salinities, different tidal range, you know, different type of food source to feed on throughout the year. You know, maybe it's not the quite right way to go in Cockies Pond. Um, and maybe we need to look at a different type of tool, um, which gets you to item which is, you know, while it can be a helpful soft solution, you know, not the right thing in every, in every situation. And you still have to really look at load management in the watershed um, and other mechanisms for, for managing water quality, whether it's, you know, natural attenuation in the watershed, reducing load from the watershed, improving flushing in the estuary, you know, things like that. Um, the thing that I want to stress is that, that these are complicated problems and there's no magic solution. There's no silver bullet. Um, oysters are one interesting soft solution amongst a number of different soft solutions and hard solutions that's worth considering, particularly as the cost for restoration can be pretty, pretty high, you know, and to the extent that you can lower those costs by doing innovative things, then that's a good thing, especially if they have multiple, multiple aspects of value. And um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Rick and he can describe all the great work that he's doing and then we can, um, and then, you know, we can keep the conversation going. Great, thank you so much, Roland. And Rick, I'll let you take it away. Well, <clears throat> thanks, Mary, for putting on this forum. It's going to be really helpful for the people to understand what we're doing and put it in perspective. And as, as Roland said, 
Um, shellfish is just one tool that we have. It, there's no silver bullet um, in and because of the estuaries project, we actually can target our areas for shellfish that would be appropriate. Um, and then we have a comprehensive watershed nitrogen management plan, um, our wastewater plan that's approved by the EPA. It was the first one uh, to use shellfish as a major component, but there's also sewering in there um, in di different parts of town. Um, and you can look at shellfish in two ways. You can look at it as a permanent solution to the problem um, in, in some areas where uh, there's a low risk of disease or predation or other problems. Um, or you can look at it as a, um, a, a early remedy while you're working on sewering more area if that's what the town wants to do. But there are areas in town that shellfish uh, can completely clean up water quality. Um, that's in the Little River, Great River, Hamlin Pond area, that's one of them. And uh, with our technical analysis, uh, we feel confident that we can do that. So uh, the next slide. Uh, this is a slide of 1978 when the shellfish populations were still uh, in good shape. And this is uh, Papanesset Bay. Um, you can see that uh, the oysters in green were farther up in the area. They were in the, the Mashpee River, most of the Mashpee River. Um, they were actually way back, they were in the whole bay. Um, and, and Chucky will tell you that um, they used to pave roads with oyster shells from, from the bay, they had so many of them. So um, that was the situation, but now they're, uh, if you go to the next slide. Um, so this is what, the next slide is just a, a graph, a description of what happens as you increase the nitrogen load. The nitrogen is, is natural, it's there, um, it's necessary for even us. And when there's a low nitrogen level, you have healthy estuaries, high species diversity, that means a lot of different kinds of critters. Um, then as you increase it a little more, actually it's beneficial. Uh, there's more algae that feeds shellfish and there aren't so many negative impacts. But then as you keep increasing the amount of nitrogen going in, um, you get algae blooms and the next threshold is that you lose the eelgrass. We've lost all the eelgrass from the Quaid and Papanesset Bays. Um, and then as the algae dies off, you get muck accumulation, which then you lose habitat. So the shellfish don't survive well in muck and the scallops don't survive well in eelgrass. We've pretty much lost those except for some success with seeding. Um, and you get lower species abundance. You have uh, less species, um, less animals and less, and less kinds of animals out there, less diverse. And then the next level as you get really high is that you start getting fish kills. Um, the algae blooms themselves will take out all the nitrogen, all the oxygen at night, and um, they they can kill fish. And that's what happened in the Mashpee River, our most impacted area. That happened in 2005. Fish, crabs, everything that didn't get out, pretty much that couldn't tolerate it, died. Um, more muck, less habitat, uh, loss of species and diversity. Um, so the next slide, um, it shows um, what happened in the Mashpee River when we had, when we got to that level of fish kills, uh, which was 2005. This is a graph of the dissolved oxygen from one of our meters. And you can see that um, the lower level, the bottoms of those graphs are getting lower during um, August. And then one, one night they just went, it took out all the oxygen and that's when the fish kill happened. But, the, but that later that day, the algae bloomed back up again. So it wasn't that they died off and decomposed, it was that the algae was so thick that they took up all the oxygen at night for respiration when they weren't making oxygen from photosynthesis. So the next slide. Um, this is what happened after we started growing oysters in the Mastery River. They were wiped out in, in the 1980s by oyster diseases primarily. Um, and they were, you couldn't, even find oysters in Mashpee. And then in 2000, uh, 2004, we started the oyster aquaculture project with the dual purpose of 
restoring the fishery and improving water quality. And we were the first ones to do, to, uh, do shellfish for water quality work um, in this area. So um, the result was that uh, we haven't had any fish kills since we established a lot of oysters in the river. We've been started harvesting in 2006. Um, and the most we harvested was half a million oysters in 2008. The harvest varies just um, depending on the success rate and um, what we put in for seed. So that worked. Um, the next slide. Um, so then after that, uh, we started growing uh, cohogs in the Great River, Little River, Hamlin Pond area. And the reason that we use cohogs over there is that it minimizes the risks. Uh, if you, when you, the Mastery River is a low salinity, low, a lot of fresh water that keeps the diseases from affecting the oysters. It also limits predators like oyster drills. Uh, and it's, it's, it, they do really well in low salinity environments. We did put oysters over in Hamlin Pond and the oyster drills ate them all up. So we switched to cohogs, which don't have as much of a um, predation problem. They don't, there's one cohog disease that doesn't affect our cohogs because it's too hot in the summer. The bays get over 85 degrees and it's too hot for the, oyster, the cohog disease. Um, and so we seeded 10 million cohogs from uh, prior to, from 2015 to 14 to 16 about. Um, and that was enough to remove enough algae and nitrogen to improve water quality and show up in our monitoring. This is a graph of the results of our monitoring that we do with SMAS, and with the tribe in the town in SMAS. And this is required, uh, the monitoring is required by the Clean Water Act, federal and state requirement for us to monitor water quality because our waters are impaired. Um, so the, the right hand bars on this graph are 2017, and you can you can see that the, the total nitrogen was reduced in the areas where we were seeding cohogs, but in Jehu Pond, where we didn't seed very many, um, the nitrogen went up. The rain, there was a lot of rain that year that made things worse in other areas. So, um, so this is the result of the shellfish, and we were about a third of the way to the target cleanup. And I mentioned that area where we have, we're pretty confident that we can clean up the whole area with shellfish. Um, so the next slide. Um, so the next slide is the full presentation, um, but I wanted to point out the um, value of the estuaries project. And I don't know where that slide went with the um, calculations from the estuaries project. I thought it was at the beginning. Um, it's, uh, farther down, but it's um, 23. So we could have just thrown a bunch of shellfish in the bays and hoped that they would clean them up. But the estuaries project gave us the, the, the numbers of uh, the amount of nitrogen that needs to be removed to restore water quality. And this is a unique program. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a really a, a model for other, other places that um, allows us to calculate what we need to do. So um, the left column on this table is calculated directly from the estuaries project reports of the amount of nitrogen that needs to be removed. What I did was calculate the amount of shellfish based on the nitrogen content that you would have to use to remove that much nitrogen. And then that gave us a target of how much shellfish we needed to, to grow. And we also need to harvest them to remove it from from the estuary, remove the nitrogen from the system. That's the goal here is to reduce the total nitrogen and restore water quality. That nitrogen is mostly in the form of phytoplankton, microalgae that shellfish eat. So uh, the, the goal in uh, uh, Papanasset Bay uh, and Akwe Bay, Mashpee River uh, is um, in Shoestring Bay it's a um, total of 16 million shellfish. We divided that up again to oysters in the upper reaches with the lower salinity and cohogs in the lower areas where there's higher salinity. Our plan, so this plan also includes 
shellfish aquaculture, private shellfish farms, because they have a role as well. And um, that's part of uh, what we're doing. The tribes uh, has a shellfish farm at the mouth of the Mashpee River. And that's part of the plan as well. Um, so there are a lot more details of how we're doing this and how it's working and what we're doing. And I don't know how much more um, time you want to spend on this initial part of it. We have a yeah. I think I think that was great, Rick. Thank you very much, and thanks to Roland. And so I'd I'd like to open it up now and let folks ask questions. And um, Rick will has provided a lot of background data that we'll we'll put on the site together with the videos. But um, now we'd like it to open it up to the audience and and see what questions you have um, concerns. You know, what, what would you like to know about the shellfish? I have a question. Sure, um, Gretchen. Thanks. You, you have that great graph with all of your goals as to how many shellfish you need. How far from that goal are we right now as far as Papanasset Bay, Mashpee River, um, Aukway Bay was on that list, Shoestring Bay? How far are we from our goals with the amount of shellfish we need? That's a good question, and that's, um, that's spelled out in the... Um, in our comprehensive watershed nitrogen management plan. These are the goals in the, on, on this graphic, but it, the plan, it goes over um, over 20 years with five year increments. And we've just started phase one. And where we started with phase one was the, what we call SC16, that's um, the marine fisheries shellfish growing area 16, which is Hamlin Pond, Little River, Great River, that area um, was is is in phase one. We started the oysters in the Mashpee River before the estuary. Well, right when the estuaries project first uh, came out with a report on Papanasset Bay, I was able to calculate the amount of oysters. The goal in the Mashpee River um, for the town part of it is uh, to harvest a million oysters. So we've gotten halfway to that goal. Um, the tribe shellfish farm at the mouth of the river has been increasing production. Um, so in the Mashpee River, uh, that part of it, um, we are um, only part way to the goal. We've, we're half a million oysters uh, is the most we've harvested on the town project. And the tribe isn't, any, isn't um, up to, the, um, to the, the millions of oysters for their part of it. Uh, but they're working on increasing production there. Um, and in Hamlin Pond, in uh, Little River and Great River, we've seeded 10 million quahog seed. There's another factor in that in, in, that's, that's really in play in that area, and that is um, we, cal we were calculating that we would need to seed uh, maybe 30 million quahogs with a, um, with a little, little over a half survival, um, like a uh, 60 percent survival from that to get 20 million cohogs. We've only seeded 10 million over a few years and we seeded another 8 million. So we've actually seeded the 20 million cohogs over a number of years, but we need to be harvesting that much per year. And what also is a factor there is that um, these shellfish that we're seeding are spawning and the increased population is seeding other areas. In, so seeding that area with spawns from the shellfish we seeded. So there's a, um, there's a second order effect in which we don't necessarily have to seed as much as we call it as for in the plan if they spawn and self seed and kind of jumpstart the, the whole process. And that we have evidence that that's happening and not only in that area, but also in the Point Bay. When these self shellfish spawn, they swim and float for a couple of weeks through the whole area. And we've seen a huge increase in the commercial harvest in McCoy Bay, which the big spawning source from that is our shellfish that we seeded in the rivers and the pond. So, so we're, we're I, I guess you might say we're a third of the way to the cleanup in uh, the SC-16 area, um, but we're only um, maybe 10% of the way in the Mashpee River um, and that's not enough to make a big difference in the water quality numbers, but we've held, we've held the line on 
the fish kill threshold where we haven't had any fish kills since we started growing all these oysters in the river. Um, and there's another factor which Roland can explain better than I can about um, the oyster beds, all the of what the oysters excrete, a lot of it settles down. It enhances natural bacterial decomposition of the nitrogen into a form that goes off into the air, nitrogen gas. And the atmosphere is 78% nitrogen. It becomes, um, it, it's not a problem once it does that. And that's a new area of work that SMAS is doing a lot of work on. And that has the potential to be removing as much nitrogen or more than the oysters themselves. So a 5% cleanup of oysters could turn into 10% of a cleanup or more. And um, that's a factor that really is hard to quantify. We're working on it. But the bottom line is if, if you get the cleanup, um, however you get it, it's going to show up in the, in the monitoring data. So, so we're just starting, um, and that's the bottom line. We're planning on working on Aquay Bay starting next year. It's a lot of work and resources, but um, the potential here is that according to the plan that the engineers did, um, if you were to use shellfish as a solution um, and, and either avoid some sewering or put it off, um, it could save the town $90 million um, is the bottom line. And in the, in the SC16 area, it could save $16 million. So it depends how you want to look at it. If you want to look at it as cleaning up the bays now before things get worse and have more impacts uh, versus um, the long-term solution, um, then you know it, it's a good idea either way. And, and it's a win-win because we're also, it's also economic development, restoring the shell fisheries uh, to the way that they were much more productive in the past. So, um, and, we, and we already have seen more shellfish harvesting in Quite Bay commercially because of what we're doing. So, so if, if I could, Rick, um, jump in. Someone in the chat, Beth, asked the question, you know, if you're talking about 16 million shellfish, that sounds like a lot of food. Um, could could there be a plan for Mashpee to bring revenue to the town and tribe when they're harvested? And could the revenue help um, fund other nitrogen nitrogen mitigation approaches? Yes, and that's already happening. The, the tribe's uh, oyster farm at the mouth of the Mashpee River uh, generates in revenue for the tribe. Um, and uh, as far in the economic development um, for the for Mashpee itself, there's an economic multiplier on the landing. So if you take the farm shellfish and the um, the commercial harvest of shellfish from the wild, that number that um, when that increases, um, there's if there's an economic multiplier of three or more times the landed value. And it's for things like, um, you know, boat repair and fuel and all these other things that, that add into the picture. So it's really, you look at it as economic development and then that turns into tax revenue for the town from the whole economy of the town via the various sources of, of revenue that the town gets from it. So if you, um, back in the old days, the, the commercial shell fishermen were making a good living doing this and they would be paying taxes on whatever they were, you know, whatever they were paying taxes on. So. But Rick, uh, you should, you should point out that uh, the town itself can't make money off the harvest. We can't harvest the shellfish and sell them. That's just to partly answer that question. But. Okay. <laughs> why, um, why, why can't, why is that the case, Tom? I'll ask Rick. Rick's the one that told me. <laughs> well, we, could, we, we not, can't grow them and sell them. <laughs> we're, 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 not in, we're not in the retail or wholesale business for anything like this. It's just like an analogy is when we lease out cranberry bogs. Um, we lease them out, we get lease revenue, and the cranberry bog operator gets the, the revenue from running the cranberry bog, but we don't sell the cranberries ourselves. So, Got it. So, uh, so that speaks, I know we have, we have Ashley Fisher, the shellfish constable on the line. Um, Ashley, I don't know, could you give us like a two minute 
summary of like how many commercial uh, shellfish licenses there are, that kind of thing? Um, hi, this is Ashley Fisher, Chatham Ashby Shellfish Constable. Um, as far as Mashby goes, we currently have 15 commercial shellfish permits. Um, the town of Salmouth is much greater. They have around 30 shellfish commercial permits. Um, but with the with the they're just they're really making good money out there every day. They're able to harvest their limit, which is three bushels per day, except for Sundays. Um, and they're all thinking the town of Mashby because of the reduction that we've done over the past few years. Um, we're self seeding the bay right now with what we're producing. Um, we've seen it in different areas of Aquia Bay, even though we're growing in Little River, Great River areas, um, all the way on the Falmouth side, our stuff is seeding Aquia Bay. So the commercial shellfishermen are defi definitely benefiting. Um, we'll only see more in the future. Hopefully, we'll have some younger people get into the business. It is a good business to get into. Um, $300 a day is substantial. Got it. Thank you. And the and, other thing, the other part of that is that the town shouldn't be displacing jobs for the public. Like if, if we were selling the shellfish, then we would be taking jobs away from commercial harvesters. And, um, you know, and th there's another uh, part of this equation too, that it's not just the town commercial permits, but the Maspee Wampanoag tribe members um, fish on their tribal IDs with they have to have a state transaction card. Um, and so they add in too, there's a number of tribe members that fish um, for a living. And that adds in there. There's not, it, it's some people that's part time, even on the town side. Um, so there's at least as many, that many more in the tribe that are fishing. Frank, uh, or Ashley, um, do you have an idea compared to the commercial permits? How many uh, oysters and all are getting harvested by people like me with our, you know, our private senior permits and all? You know, what what kind of percentages between commercial and everybody else? Oh, it's a very small percentage compared to our recreational permits that are given. There's about a thousand, more or less, a little over a thousand um, family permits. We call them. Um, and then, but again, the tribe, we, they fish on their tribal IDs. So that adds in a, more than, more than that. And the oyster harvest is all, um, is all recreational. That half million oysters, the most we've, we've harvested in a year. Um, that was all family fishing. Uh, so it, it's, we have a much bigger family rec, uh, recreational fishery than commercial at this point, but once we get this uh, fully implemented, there would be more commercial shell fishing. Can I ask um, what the current limitations are for implementing phase one completely? Well, there's a there's a economy of scale. Well, it's not an economy of scale. There's a, there's a scale up factor. If we had, if we had just started day one to implement the entire plan with a um, million and a half dollars worth of shellfish seed. Um, and, and if we, I don't think we could even have assembled the staff to do it. We, you just can't implement the huge pro, well, we are not implementing this at a full scale to start with just because it's, it's, it's a little risky. You really want to build up the capacity and that's why it's in phases. Um, so, um, I hope that answers your question. Well, I, I'm just wondering if, if it is a staffing issue, is it possible for a group like ours to um, inspire people to do something by volunteering and helping seed the bay? Actually, Ashley's got, Ashley, you can answer that one. Are you still there? Oh, I May, if you if you called in Ashley star six to unmute yourself, I was unmute. yeah. I just, I think I just found out. Okay, yeah, we do have a volunteer program right now. We're just kind of getting off the ground, and um, we're called the Mashby Muscles, and um, we will be um, having a bunch of volunteer opportunities in the future once we're scaling up. 
Great. And I'll, I'll share that, that program. I, I know you have a pamphlet already, Ashley. I'll share that on our page where we have all the resources related to this. And, Great. And Thank you, Mary. There's another a part of this too, is that we actually were the first ones to do this kind of a project for water quality restoration. And it really, um, a lot of people are um, skeptical that it will work. So we really had to prove it. And we started proving it with the results that we're getting, especially um, the results on the cohogs um, that's showing that we're reducing the nitrogen significantly. And so we needed to really needed to walk, uh, crawl before we walk, I guess is what you would say. But we need, we need to start this out at a level we could manage and prove that it works and then expand from there. So that, that's what we're doing. Uh, are there, just to add on to that, what Nancy said, are there other, other actions or things that could be done that would help, uh, like facilities or equipment or, you know, people is just one of the, the assets that, uh, that could be scaled Actually, up? Actually, we've been scaling up the facilities and equipment. We have a state-of-the-art upweller system. And Mary, if you want to show some of those slides, um, we've recently... Uh, put in a state-of-the-art upweller at Little River where you in with on land and then some on the docks. And um, those are working really well. Um, we've, we're um, looking at um, sources of funding for um, building more facilities. This, this is the land-based upweller. We start out with little tiny sand-sized seed from the hatchery. Um, and maybe Ashley should explain this. This is her project. So. Yeah, this is our land. Am I, can you hear me still? Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is one of our land-based systems. We have two. Well, there's one to the um, to the left in this picture. Um, basically, we can house um, five million total at 1.5 millimeters when we get them from the hatchery, and um, we're working on scaling up at our aqua facility possibly. Um, but this is the two systems that we have on the land. And then on our docks, which I don't know if Mary has a picture of, but we do have floating upwelling systems. So this is the same type of system, but it's within our docks at the town complex, the Little River. And in the past year, we've scaled up significantly. We've put in two brand new units, as well as the three units we had in previous years, we've altered and made more efficient. Um, so we're definitely working on scaling up to house the numbers that are projected are 10 to 20 million cohogs in the future. And next year's budget includes um, funding for expanding into the Aqua Bay um, area as part of this implementation, putting um, these types of systems down there. Um, this picture is the, the next step after the upwellers uh, or an alternate from the floating upwellers is trays in the river. And Ashley was able to grow 5 million cohogs in these trays at Little River. And then we also put them under nets planting them in the bottom and covering with nets, keep predators from eating them until they get bigger. Uh, so we've, we've really uh, been working out the systems that we're using. There's a lot of ways to do this and um, we've worked out the systems that work for us. And so the, these are some of those systems, the oysters in the Mashpee River. Um, we use a different system. It's a remote set, they call it, where the shellfish are uh, attached to shell at the, the oyster, baby oysters, microscopic oysters. Um, that's a miracle seeding the quahog seed at the end. Um, and it would probably be good to go through this in a moment. Um, so I don't think we have, the, well, we have the, this of the, the, yeah, um, the, the remote sensor. I think the next slide, Mary, 29, slide 29 does show our trees, yeah. Yeah, this, so this is one of the bottom oyster trees that we have in the Mashpee River. And so that we goes, have that's floating there, but then later you sink it to the bottom. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, this is just a miracle. They're working on them, splitting our remote set oyster bags within the to the tray. Um, then they'll be set on bottom for grow out until harvest time, where we'll move them to the area where family shellfish permit holders can harvest. Next nice. slide has that. Yeah, this is a picture of our bottom trays. The oysters in here are probably ready for transport to be harvested by family permit holders. Got it. And they grow extremely well in this river. The, 
the conditions are excellent. Um, they we've we've really had huge success with the the oyster project as as we've mentioned. So, can you can you address? I, you know, I look at this. I know this is this is part of your process. But um, I know that in the past there have been some concerns about the commercial uh, shellfish being visible or being a problem for navigation or, you know, um, just the views of people in the bay. Is that is that an issue or? Well, for the town project in the tribes project um, aquaculture farm at the mouth of the river, we grow them on the bottom. And this is a picture at low tide. This is an extreme low tide. Normally you wouldn't see this um, in the fall. This is a fall picture. Um, so they're, we, they're on the bottom. We haven't had any complaints about them. Um, they're on the sides and we put them out of the way of navigation and mark them. So we've never had anybody running into them that we know of. Um, but the, com the commercial farms, and, and I, I should probably, um, there's a slide in this, I'll just describe the the difference between, the reason we're using both approaches is um, the, the farming is limited to areas that are not naturally productive and that's a limited area. And um, the, they use some, we, there's some people who use some floating gear that has some visual impacts, but uh, mostly it's on the bottom. And even um, Dick Cook's uh, new, new site in the middle of Papanessa Bay that had a lot of opposition now that he's running it, people are realizing that it's not really um, a problem. We haven't had complaints about that since he started it. So we don't use a lot of floating gear. We, we really use bottom gear and it, it doesn't have those impacts. Okay. Um, there's a question from the chat uh, from Rosa, and I don't know, Roland, or if you wanna jump in on this or, or Rick, um, do you anticipate adverse effects on shellfish aquaculture due to warmer waters and subsequent lower pH levels? Oh, that's that's one of the slides at the bottom here. Um, I've grown oysters in 100 degree water. In fact, the mouth of the river, we've measured 90 degree water at low tide. Um, so these the oysters and, I, and cohogs actually have grown cohogs at 90 degrees. Um, they they can, they can handle it. But um, as far as ocean acidification, um, and that's a good question. I, I love these questions. This is the, the graph of the projected pH from CO2 rise. Um, in the, the pH in the ocean would project it to decrease. Um, the, um, the pH might go down to uh, eight um, around there by 2015. The, the ocean's a little over 8, 8.2. Um, so they're, they're projecting down to 8. If our estuaries have far greater pH swings than the ocean, and our shellfish are adapted to it. So if you look at the next slide, remember that 8. Look at the next slide. This is an actual uh, plot of pH from the Childs River, um, where Webner has a monitoring unit, and we have um, a lot of algae blooms and, and a lot of water quality problems. At night, you can see this pH goes down to six and a half at below seven, way farther than they're predicting that the ocean will go to. And during the day, it jumps up to nine. This is because of the effect of photosynthesis removing carbon. So, and, and our shellfish grow just fine. They, they grow actually really fast in these areas when there's a lot of food. So. So ocean acidification is not going to be a problem in our estuaries in the foreseeable future. I think um, also, it's, I think it's important to remember that estuaries are pretty stressful environments in the, in the first place. I mean, there's large tide ranges, there's large oxygen changes. There's a lot of things going on in an estuary, very dynamic. And these creatures are really pretty hardy. I mean, in my mind, one of the things that we've been seeing that has been most problematic in some of the places that we've been growing oysters, you know, if the salinity regime is isn't quite right, then that can be a, a, an impediment to being able to successfully propagate oysters. And in the case of like Cocky's Pond, the salinity range just isn't really that conducive to good oyster growth. I mean, with the salinity tending to be too low rather than, you know, on the higher side of what they like. And you know, in the future, 
relative to climate change, I mean, depending on how that affects precipitation and how that then translates to changes in freshwater inflows to the estuaries, you know, maybe that that can be an, you know, an issue if there's, you know, a significantly more amount of fresh water entering the estuaries than, you know, than previously, then that might be, you know, that might be a consideration. That will just actually help us in Mashpee because, um, the, as I said, that there's a risk of oyster diseases at the higher salinities. So the farther out these brackish areas with the low salinity go, the better we will be able to grow oysters, the farther out we'll be able to grow oysters. So I don't foresee that as a problem. And there's, there's one more risk that, that we face um, with as you um, increase the algae blooms, and this is happening worldwide, you increase the chances of what we call harmful algae blooms, like red tide and toxic algae. And um, that can happen. We haven't had a problem with that in Mashpee. Um, we might be the last town to be impacted by red tide on the Cape, but um, they, the man, we can manage around that. And there's a new tool being developed by Scott Gallagher from the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, which is the slide above this, above these two slides. It's an automated monitoring system. This is the HABSTAT system. And as it stands now, we have to take samples and look under the microscope, which we do. So in Mashpee, you're well protected. We have a huge margin of safety from any of these kind of harmful algal blooms because we're actually routinely looking at the water under the microscope and looking for not only harmful algae, but we're looking to see how much good algae is there. Other towns are not protected in this way. Um, the state has a monitoring system for testing shellfish if, if there looks like there's a problem coming down from Maine, where they often come from. But this new system would be, it, it, we are deploying it in uh, Santuit Pond for algae blooms there right now, the prototype. But it, it will be real time measuring algae and to potential toxin um, and transmitting that. So. This is a phenomenal breakthrough. Uh, we're really excited about it for um, the off for the, the uh, toxic algae in um, the coastal areas. And what that does, if we ever get a bloom, the management tool is that we just stop the harvest until the bloom goes away and the and the and the, uh, the shellfish test okay for eating. This is a huge problem up in Prince Edward Island, where when you go to the restaurant, and you order mussels in the menu they have these some of these harmful algal blooms and they that's what they do they monitor for it when they see it they shut down the harvest they wait till it goes away they test the mussels until they're they're clean and no toxin and then they sell them so we we have been able to uh, develop management strategies for all these problems and over the course of developing the comprehensive plan we had a lot of meetings and we got a lot of comments and I just loved the devil's advocates who would bring up problems. And then I would try to figure out how to solve them. And we've been able to solve all of them. So things like comments that, well, that shellfish can die. And so sewage treatment is better. I'm not saying that it's, a, it's an either or, but the nitrogen treatment, sewage treatment plants use bacteria. And if too much toxic stuff is dumped down the drain, they can be killed off. So it's analogous that they're both living organisms that can be killed off and there's a risk of losing them. Um, so in storms where we're growing these in the upper areas of the estuary during storms, the water level goes up. They don't have a lot of wave action. Um, they would probably be fine in even a category one hurricane. They were in Hurricane Bob. We didn't see any shellfish losses from that. So if anybody has any other uh, concerns or criticisms, I would love to hear them. Please, you know, bring them up anytime. Yeah, that's a great opening. I don't know if there are any last questions from people on the line. I just have one program note. The Sewer Commission meeting next Thursday, the 17th, we'll be getting a presentation on the final draft plan for our treatment plant at the uh, transfer station. And uh, one thing that the engineers have done is they've actually uh, gone back and looked at all the all the private treatment plants in town and sort of drawn a 500 foot diameter circle around all of them because of this issue of neighbors. And it's amazing. Uh, we have one neighbor within 500 feet. The other ones are just loaded with neighbors. So um, that, that's 
that I'm trying to get that on TV, like all of our sewer commissions meetings used to be. We'll see. Theoretically, it's at seven o'clock next Thursday, but uh, keep your eyes open for the scheduling on that because uh, I would like to get that on TV, which also means it'll get recorded so people can see it later. Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, and I'll just uh, ask one last question because I know this is something I get a, a lot of questions from uh, people in the community. Uh, Rick is, you know, will, will we ever be able to kind of s do things like the shellfish farming, the like individuals raising or seeding in their, in their areas, the way they do down in the Chesapeake Bay? Oh, oyster gardening, you're talking gardening. about. Gardening. Yeah, um, that's what they call it. Um, the scale, we could do that. It's a, a little bit difficult with the Massachusetts permitting framework, um, but the scale of it is we just we need it's a much bigger scale project than would be able to be significantly impacted by individual um, homeowners growing shellfish. It's That's just, fair. It, it's it's it, I mean we've and obviously again uh, you know the, the estuaries project is so key to all of this and our our comprehensive plan that we have too um, that it, it we've really worked it all out to the scale that we need and it's a combination of um, what's of uh, restoring the wild fishery and um, aquaculture, uh, what we call private shellfish farming. Um, it's a combination. We're, we're using all the tools we can, including um, the uh, fertilizer management. We have fertilizer management bylaws. It's really best management practices. And that, that's going to potentially save us money um, on that. So Mashpee is really on the forefront of all of this, all all the all the things in the toolbox um, were the key things we're we're working on. Well, that's a great segue because I'll um I'll let everybody know that two weeks from tonight, our next program will be on land management. So things like fertilizer, uh, stormwater runoff, other things. I don't know. Nancy's organizing that. Nancy, if you want to say anything about it or. She's probably muted. Um, anyway, so watch for that two weeks from now. And uh, Roland, any last comments? Um, thank you so much for being here, both to you and Rick and Ashley. No, my pleasure. I mean, I think the, the only thing I'd like to just stress is keep an open mind. There's a lot of different ways to skin the cat. And, um, you know, you got to explore all of them. They're not all necessarily applicable to the same level of efficacy um, and, uh, you know, push on all fronts. Great. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to everybody who joined us. Thanks for the questions. Thanks for the support. Uh, we're getting a lot of good feedback about our effort here. We're just going to keep on with this um, series to educate and then uh, but then we'll be talking about uh, where we go from there to try and help support action yeah, uh, going you, Mary. forward. Yeah, appreciate all your efforts as well. And, um, you know, keep, uh, don't despair. Keep, keep fighting the fight. We will. <laughs> Thank you, Mary. All right. Thanks, all right, everybody.